right, so today I wanted to share with you the case of the disappearance of Laureen Ran. This happened on the April of 26th or April 27th in 1980 in Manchester, New Hampshire, United States. She has been missing ever since, so today I wanted to share with you the details they shared with us through the wikis. So let's get right into it. So here we are, on the evening of April 26th, 1980. Lorene was left to stay at home at the residence she shared with her mother, a third floor apartment on Merrimack Street in Manchester, New Hampshire. Her mother, Judith, was spending the evening attending an out-of-town tennis match with her boyfriend. Ron, who was on a spring break at the time, invited one male and one female friend over, and the three drank beer and wine together. At some point during the evening, Ron's male friend heard voices in the apartment building's hallways and exited the apartment through a back door, assuming that Rand's mother was returning home and that he would get in trouble if he was found there. The male friend stated that he heard Ron lock the door behind him as he left. Sometime around 1.15 a.m. on April 27th, Judith arrived home and noticed that the light bulbs on all three of the apartment building's floors had been unscrewed, leaving the hallways completely dark. When she arrived at her apartment's front door, she found it unlocked. Before going to bed, she looked into Ron's room and saw a figure asleep in bed, assuming it to be her daughter. Several hours later, around 3.45 a.m., Judith awoke and found that it had in fact not been Ron asleep in her bed, but instead her female friend who had spent the night. Her friend claimed that she had last seen Ron asleep on the couch in the living room. Upon further examination of the apartment, Judith found articles of Ron's clothing and her brand new sneakers in the living room, and the back door was open. Now that already sounds a little suspicious and creepy if you think about the whole scenario in which this all took place apparently according to her mother. I mean light bulbs unscrewed, all sorts of strange darkness going on in your apartment building. Sounds very inviting to me. Now sadly though this girl vanished that night. Whatever happened to her, that is the mystery. They did have some other events going on at the time as well. Because six weeks after the disappearance of Loreen, Denise, a young woman who lived two blocks from the residence where they lived, went missing from a bar in Manchester. Decades later, police determined that suspected serial killer Terry Rasmussen was living in the area under the pseudonym Bob Evans. Rasmussen later pleaded guilty to murdering his wife in California in 2003 and died in 2010. Authorities believe he may have been involved in as many as five more murders and or disappearances, including that of Denise, who vanished in Goffstown in 1981 and was never found, as well as the Bear Brook murders, which refers to four female murder victims found in the Bear Brook State Park between 1985 and 2000. One of the victims was his biological daughter. Now that's pretty, pretty sick right there. He took his own daughter's life? Guy was crazy, that's for sure. But here's where things get even more bizarre and kind of creepy at the same time. Get this. On October 1st, 1980, Judith found she had been charged for three phone calls placed in California. She did not have friends or relatives there, and Rand had never had any ties to the area. Two calls were placed from a motel in Santa Monica, and another from a motel in Santa Ana. The latter of which was made to a teen sexual assistance hotline. Detectives spoke with the physician who maintained the hotline and he initially denied having known anything of the call. Five years later, in 1985, the physician changed his story. He claimed that numerous young women and runaways occasionally visited his wife at their home and that one of the girls may have been wrong. He also stated that Annie Sprinkle, a sex educator and former pornographic actress who allegedly knew his wife, might have information regarding Ron's disappearance and those of other runaway girls. However, law enforcement was unable to find any evidence linking Sprinkle to Ron's disappearance. And throughout 1981, Judith claimed to have received numerous mysterious phone calls from an unknown individual, which she has always received at approximately 3.45 a.m. During those calls, she claimed the caller never spoke. The phone calls continued for several years after Ron's disappearance, increasing in frequency during the Christmas holiday. 
The calls eventually stopped after she changed her phone number several years after Ron's disappearance. Now that already sounds kind of creepy as well. I mean, it's it's like what what do you make of that little detail about this case? Also because it was 3:45 a.m. That was also around the time that they initially realized that the daughter was missing. It's so bizarre, isn't it? Like it's it almost it makes me think of supernatural movies almost where that happens where maybe the spirit of somebody is trying to call you which happens in the movies i've never heard of that happening in real life but that's almost what the scenario sounds like now judith hired a private investigator to visit california in 1986 who located the motels from which the october 1980 phone calls had been placed local police in santa monica stated that one of the motels may have been used as a filming location by a child pornographer known as Dr. Z. However, law enforcement was unable to link Dr. Z to the hotline. The same year, a childhood friend of Ron's named Roger Marais received a phone call from a woman who claimed to be Lori or Lorene. His mother answered the phone call and stated that the woman claimed to have been her son's former girlfriend. Very suspicious as well. Very strange. All of this is so bizarre. Now there's some alleged sightings that they got documented here that happened in 1981. After the receipt of the October 1980 phone calls, a family member of Ron's claimed to have seen her at a bus terminal in Boston, Massachusetts. This sighting remains unconfirmed. Another unconfirmed sighting occurred in 1988 when a witness claimed to have seen a prostitute in Alaska who matched Ron's description. So who knows, was it that person? That's the mysterious part about this disappearance. And with most of these cases in the past when I shared them they always tend to be very uh, very bizarre like what actually happened to these people I mean the fact that they're gone for decades probably indicates that they're not even alive anymore but even then where's the body right it's so disturbing for the family members left behind that you actually can never get proper closures on any of this now sometime after the mid 1980s Judith remarried and relocated to Florida she has stated that she believes her daughter placed the phone calls from California in October 1980. The unnamed male friend who was drinking alcohol with Ron the night she disappeared committed suicide in 1985, though law enforcement never considered him a suspect in her disappearance. Investigators assigned to Ron's case have stated they believe foul play is involved. And yes, I guess we can all agree on that because the case and the details that they have about it are very, very bizarre very surreal so i hope that perhaps one day it all comes to light but you know the odds of that happening are always very very slim especially if decades have already passed so that makes me feel kind of bad for these family members so assuming that she's not alive i hope she's resting in peace and whoever the perpetrator is maybe one day they'll figure it out or maybe they never will that's the sad reality of these cases and with that being said dear viewer half sweet dreams.